Well, Ches Kohalt, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, uh, welcome to the Federal Reserve's third Indian Country Policy Webinar of 2021, titled The Power to Tax, Addressing Economic Parity in Indian Country. We are joined today by tribal leaders and national experts to discuss the complexities of taxation in Indian Country and to explore policy solutions that may create more certainty and to increase the utility of taxation in Indian Country. My name is Casey Lozar and I'm the director of the Federal Reserve Center for Indian Country Development and an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. The center, or as we call, call it the CICD, is a, a research and policy institute based out of the Minneapolis Fed whose mission is to assist in reach, assisting tribes in reaching their full economic potential. And we do this by conducting research and convening partners to discuss opportunities to increase economic outcomes in the Indian country. Today's policy webinar is the third in our series for 2021. And the purpose of the series is to create a, a collaborative space for tribal leaders, for researchers, for policymakers, to discuss barriers to economic growth in Indian country, but, but more importantly, to focus on the policy levers that drive long-term economic sustainability and help to influence tribal public finance. Uh, previous policy webinars have covered pandemic-influenced economic policies and best practices in tribal enterprise diversification. And in the near future, uh, we'll have another webinar to address policy improvements to tax credits and financing programs for tribes. These, these are the areas of focus that, are, that CICD and our partners are focusing on as it relates to our, our research. And they really represent um, subjects that we believe have real policy implications for tribal public finance and will ultimately improve the health and the economic well being of Indian Country. Uh, while you will hear from several experts this afternoon, and each will provide a, a few minutes of uh, perspectives on taxation, we, we do want to hear from you. Uh, so there'll be an opportunity towards the end of the webinar to pose questions to the speakers. To pose a question, uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll do our best to share your questions uh, with the moderator and the panelists. Also, today's webinar uh, will be recorded and made available to the public for future viewing. Now, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce you to today's moderator, Chief Lynn Malerba. Chief Malerba became chief of the Mohegan tribe in 2010, which is a, a lifetime appointment. She is currently a, a member of the Department of the Treasury's Tribal Tax Advisory Council and chair of the subcommittee on dual taxation. And among many, many other things, uh, Chief Malerba is a current member of the Federal Reserve's Center for Indian Country Development's Leadership Council. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Chief Lynn Malerba. Well, thank you very much, Casey. This is going to be a very interesting panel and I'm very excited to be a part of it. Uh, so uh, I would just once again, um, say thank you to the Center for Indian Country Development for hosting this very important webinar. I'm Chief Many Hearts, Lynn Malerba of the Mohegan Tribe. I'm pleased to serve on the Leadership Council for the Center for Indian Country Development and also as the Board Secretary for the United South and Eastern Tribe Sovereignty Protection Fund. Economic development in Indian Country is such an important tool in rebuilding our tribal nations. Through our enterprises, we are able to secure our sacred sites, which we had may have previously been, a, been unable to do. Uh, for example, uh, Mohegan was unable to protect its um, burial grounds, our, our sacred burial grounds from the state who had taken it in, em in eminent domain to create a state park. We've been able to promote and in some cases restore our cultures, restore or continue to speak our languages and to provide services to our tribal citizens designed to enhance their well-being at all stages in life. 
Despite longstanding trust and treaty obligations agreed to between our tribal sovereign nations and the sovereign United States, those agreed upon exchanges of goods and services in return for our lands and mineral rights have never been fully funded. We as tribal sovereigns look to economic development as a means to exercise our sovereign rights, to provide for our governmental structure, infrastructure, and tribal citizens. And that's why taxation authority and uncertainty in tax policy is so important to us. Tax dollars that leave our reservations do not return to us in the form of much needed infrastructure, essential services, and other needed programs that any government must provide to ensure a healthy, thriving community. And even if some of those taxes do return to us from the state that we reside in, they may not be aligned with the priorities that we have for our tribal community. So as part of the General Welfare Exemption Act, the Treasury was uh, required to develop the Treasury uh, Tribal Advisory Committee, um, known as the acronym TTAC. One of the very important issues TTAC has begun to address is the subject of dual taxation, meaning that one sovereign government is imposing taxation on economic development um, on another uh, sovereign. Um, and so in this case, local and state governments are taxing economic activities on tribal lands. A subcommittee was developed to explore the issue of dual taxation and provide recommendations to the Department of Treasury, who has used the document to initiate consultation with tribal nations to determine how best to resolve this issue. The report describes concepts regarding sovereign taxation jurisdiction and laws affecting uh, taxation in tribal nations um, and taxation on tribal lands. Quoting from the report, until dual taxation where state and local governments tax on reservation business activity is addressed, tribal governments will struggle to enhance and diversify their reservation ec economies. They'll be unable to stabilize the tribal tax and regulatory environment and be unable to meet the needs of their governments. Uh, within the United States. And tribal governments must have equal standing with all governments within the United States regarding taxing and regulatory authority. In 1982, the Supreme Court um, in Marion versus Hikarilla Apache tribe concluded that the power to tax is an essential attribute of Indian sovereignty because it is a necessary instrument of self-government and territorial management. This power enables a tribal government to raise revenues for its essential services. It derives from the tribe's general authority as sovereign to control economic activities within its jurisdiction and to defray the cost of providing governmental services by requiring contributions from persons or enterprises engaged in such activities within their jurisdiction. So this statement really underscores two very important concepts. First, that taxation is an important instrument of being a sovereign. And second, taxation finances government. An infringement upon the right to tax infringes upon the core attributes of sovereign governance. Included in the report is a discussion of not only how dual taxation has negatively impacted tribal governments, but also the positive impact for local and state governments when there is successful economic activity on tribal lands and it provides recommendations on what potential rev remedies would be. As sovereigns, each tribe has the authority to determine taxation policy on their lands with the goal of providing goods and services to their citizens. Unlike other governments, tribes do not tax their citizens, instead using economic development to provide for their nation citizens. As you will hear today about some of the, ch the challenges that we face, you will also hear how beneficial tribal enterprises are to their neighboring governments and citizens. We believe strongly that fair tax policies for tribes only benefit local and state government rather than create a negative economic impact. Two of the most important policy recommendations from this report are that tribal tax codes, agreements, and tribal tax compacts with states and local governments free from interest balancing tests or dual taxation schemes should serve as the legal basis for relationships between the tribes, federal, state, and local governments. And that intertribal commerce is and should not be subject to state or local government taxation. So I would ask that you see the link in the chat for the entire report and recommendations. We have terrific panelists today and I encourage you to read their bios provided as part of this webinar. I'll now turn the conversation to Carol, the Executive Director for the United South and Eastern Tribes Sovereign, 
Sovereignty Protection Fund, who will discuss level setting tribal relations based on sovereignty. Thank you, Chief Malerba. So uh, in order to have a government tax parity and equity conversation, uh, we must start with the foundational point that tribal nations are inherently sovereign. And while that may sound obvious to many of us, uh, we also recognize that for a variety of reasons, uh, many may not appropriately recognize this very point. In fact, although not properly taught, tribal nation sovereignty predates the sovereignty of states and the United States. This is a fundamental and critical point that must be understood and embraced to best understand any country's positions, not only when it comes to taxation matters, uh, but all matters that are within the space of tribal nations exerting our inherent sovereign rights and authorities as we seek to strengthen our respective nations. A strengthening that will serve to improve uh, the health and wellness of our citizens and improve the vibrancy of our communities. This responsibility is the same and something that we share in common with other, other government structures. Throughout our complex and complicated relationship with the United States, one based and rooted in diplomacy, there have been many federal policies, including policies of assimilation and termination that sought to unjustly, inappropriately, and illegally diminish our in, or outrightly erase our sovereignty. These federal actions have created a paternalistic and colonial understanding of our sovereign status that often stands in contradiction of sovereignty principles, and they exist as an unnecessary and unjust barrier uh, to our efforts. As Chief Malerva stated in her remarks, the lands and natural resources that the United States now claims at its own once all belonged to Indian country. Whether through negotiation or more likely through force or coercion, there was an exchange of lands and natural resources that resulted in a promise by the United States to ensure for our well being, a promise that not only exists in perpetuity and there is no expiration date. And having these types of conversations like we're having this afternoon, it bears repeating these lands and these natural resources are part of the foundational strength and wealth of the United States today. And its citizens continue to benefit from this exchange on a daily basis. This exchange further serves as the very basis of the trust relationship today. While time limitations don't allow me to get into all the layers associated with that trust model or the related trust obligations, it is not an overstatement to say that the United States has never fully honored its trust and treaty obligations to any country. One has to look no further than the 2003 U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Quiet Crisis Report or its 2018 Broken Promises Report update. And shamefully, but not a surprise to any country, both reports clearly underscore how the United States has failed miserably in honoring its promises. As a result, there is a direct correlation between these failures and the challenges that any country collectively seeks to overcome to this day. High unemployment, some of the worst health disparities in the country, educational challenges, just to cite a few. Seven of the 10, 12, seven of the 12 poorest counties in the United States fall within Indian country. And while the United States may never fully honor its obligations to Indian country, it's not because it lacks the ability. Rather, it lacks the will to prioritize these first obligations, these sacred promises. Despite this unfortunate likelihood, Indian country remains steadfast and will continue to advocate with the ultimate goal of having the United States completely fulfill the promises it made to us. This is not a naive pursuit, but one rooted in principle and rooted in honor. However, that is not to suggest that Indian country is not doing anything else to take control and respond to its challenges and to pursue opportunities. Partly due to these failures, but also as a reflection of the natural maturation and growth process of tribal nation governments, tribal nations are taking control of their destiny more and more as they seek to nation rebuild after centuries of destructive federal Indian policy. Ultimately, our nation rebuilding efforts are a reflection of our perseverance and desire to best provide for the needs of our citizens by strengthening our tribal nation economies. Again, a goal that all governments should share in common. Unfortunately though, as you heard from Chief Malerba, our efforts are not without challenges, opposition and interference. By example, it is a constant struggle to achieve a norm that ensures all revenues and profits generated in any country have the opportunity to experience the benefit of the economic multiplier effect that is key to economic growth and strengthening for any economy. This example and many others stand in direct conflict 
with our economic sovereignty efforts, economic sovereignty that is essential to our ability to be self-determining and self-sufficient. It is important to stress that our efforts do not just benefit any country. Our efforts serve to strengthen our economies, also benefit our non-native relatives through expanded employment opportunities, but also the tribal nation activities, our efforts generate billions of dollars of economic activity in other economies through the power of expanded trade and commerce. However, due to the underlying failures of other government entities not adequately understanding tribal sovereignty, we constantly have to fight to prevent other governments from unjustly intruding and interfering on our efforts. Tax policy fairness towards tribal governments and the promotion of economic growth are critical to Indian country. Numerous con Congresses and administrations have committed to enhancing the economic well-being of tribal nations, but this cannot be accomplished without a better understanding of our sovereign position that will serve to support long-awaited changes to the U.S. tax code. Tribal governments continue to lack many of the benefits and flexibilities offered to other units of government under the tax code. The United States has a responsibility to ensure that federal tax laws treat tribal nations in a manner consistent with our government status as reflected under the US Constitution and numerous federal laws, treaties, and federal court decisions, and just to ensure that there is absolute certainty in tax jurisdiction confirming the exclusive taxing authority of tribal governments on all economic activities occurring within our borders and jurisdictions. As identified through the Growing Economies in Any Country Workshop and published by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, the challenges, and the challenges beyond the foundational lack of our sovereignty to build strong tribal nation economies throughout Indian country fall into eight areas. Insufficient capital, access to capital, capacity and constraints on small business resource providers, insufficient workforce development, financial management training and business education, tribal governance constraints, trust and restricted land status constraints, underdeveloped infrastructure, insufficient research and data, and lack of regional collaboration. And finally, as you heard again from Chief Malerba, I want to stress again, addressing these challenges is not just good for Indian country. Strong tribal nations absolutely translate into a strengthening of surrounding communities and economies, and strong tribal nations absolutely translate into a strong United States. Thank you. Chief Malerba. Thank you, Kitki. Um, I really appreciate your comments and, and look forward to having more uh, dialogue with our Q&A. Uh, next, we will hear from Jean Swift, who is a formal tribal treasurer for the Mashantucket Pequot tribe. She is currently the interim chief financial officer who will share some of the challenges that her tribal nation has encountered regarding tax parity issues and dual taxation. Jean. Thank you, Chief Malerba. I was honored to serve with uh, Chief Malerba on the um, dual taxation subcommittee in 2000, in 2020, which is a part of the TTAC. I was also honored to be a part of the um, Internal Revenue Services Advisory Council, specifically the tax exempt and governmental entities subgroup chair, where we took on certain taxation issues regarding Indian country. Dual taxation remains to be at the top of the list. I'd like now to spend a few moments just reviewing with you, you know, a significant case um, that um, has been, at, you know, for um, Mashantucket uh, versus Ledger out for some time. Part, portions of this case were presented to um, the USEP board back in, during the impact week in February of 2017 with the then general counsel, Betsy Conway. Um, to, to start with, I'd like to first talk a little bit about the Connecticut Revenue Ruling 2002-3 um, between the um, state of Connecticut and the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation. And in certain respects, to, to Kiki's excellent point, um, tax sovereignty, to think that we actually have to do a revenue ruling with the state in order to get permission to have certain areas that, that we can tax is really um, it is quite frustrating. But in our hey, revenue Jean. ruling. Hey, yeah. Jean, this, this is Casey, and sorry to interrupt. Um, okay. But could you turn on your video? Oh, absolutely. Apologies. Perfect. We can see you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Casey. Um, my apologies. 
So with the Connecticut um, revenue ruling that I was just referencing 2002-3, there's in the first section, it talks about the tribal taxes, um, the structure that the Mashantuckets could essentially tax with respect to hotel occupancy, admissions for events and food and beverages. It then goes on to talk a bit about the state taxing structure um, for the state of Connecticut. And it's very liberal, as you can imagine, for the state of Connecticut. They're permitted to assess um, essentially sales tax um, on retail items for those that are sold to anyone other than tribal members, including tribal members, if it's used, um, if the product or services to be consumed off reservation. The revenue ruling further states that um, sales by the tribe outside of Indian country um, on such as on tangible personal property services, including lodging and entertainment could also be assessed. In 1998, the MPTN enacted its own title uh, 16, which is called the general revenue and tax code. In that we have a tribal tax rate of 7.35% versus the state's rate of 6.35%. The tribal tax, however, is imposed on, re on retail sa sales, but are given a credit for the 6.35%, because again, if we were to tax on top of the state rate, you'd have an effective tax rate of nearly 15%, which would make things in certain cases almost cost prohibitive for consumers. So we're only essentially receiving a 1% tax, sales tax on goods because the state is consuming the other 6.35%. I'd like to turn now to talk a little bit more specifically about the Mashantucket Pequot tribe versus the town of Ledger case, the, the suit that the tribe first brought in 2006 against the town in order to stop the taxation of leased slot machines that were located on the reservation. This was an issue of a good news versus bad news situation. Initially, the ruling that we received was good news. Um, we won at the district court level. Um, and essentially the ruling was that the state property tax on leased slot machines was preempted by federal law, specifically IGRA, and the balance of interest weighed in favor of the tribe and federal interest. Unfortunately, years later, the bad news, this ruling was overturned in July of 2013 in the Second Circuit. It was reversed. Since then, that since that decision, the town has more aggressively sought to assess and collect taxes, not only on lease slot machines, but on any personal property located on reservation and not owned by the MPTN. Ledger's arguments in this case were presented as such, three specific points. They asserted that the property owned by non-Indians subject to tax was subject to tax under US Supreme Court cases. They also asserted that Ledger incurs costs of additional services such as road maintenance, police and so forth because of reservation tribal businesses. Their third argument was that tribal member children who live on the reservation attend the neighboring uh, school district and that presented an, an additional cost. Our counter arguments, although very valid, were not accepted. Essentially, our first is that Ledger receives federal grant dollars per student, so it more, and covers, more than covers their per student uh, costs or incremental costs. A second argument or counter argument we presented is that, that the tribe has its own governmental services that it provides, including various public safety departments. We have our own tribal police. We maintain our own roads and infrastructure, not only through our own um, governmental dollars, but also from grant, uh, federal grant monies we receive. And our third argument is that the MPTN is the largest taxpayer for the town of Ledger for the property located adjacent to our reservation. We have uh, two trees in and other land parcels and entities. And so we pay significant taxes to the town of Ledger already um, is what one of the assertions that we had made. After following the second circuit decision, 
Ledger has now assessed and collected property taxes on all personal property owned by anyone other than the tribe, which includes furniture, fixtures, and equipment owned by our tenants and our new retail outlets. They also have assessed personal property owned by entities formed under state law by tribal members. We have a tribal member owned business um, that's unfortunately the personal property is assessed and they actually pay personal property taxes to the town of Ledger even for this tribal member owned business. Also since that ruling in May of 2015, the Tanger outlets opened at Foxwoods. Instead of MPTN collecting tax revenue from this economic development, the town of Ledger has intrusively taxed each of these businesses and all of the subtenants of the Tanger outlets. Despite us being the government providing all the on-reservation governmental services. The MPTN provides several governmental services and infrastructure maintenance on the reservation, yet we are restrained from asserting our full taxing authority to fund these governmental services because we do not want to expose our patrons, tenants, and vendors to double taxation. Many of the governmental services include public safety, as mentioned before, uh, police, fire, and 911 dispatch, several regulatory agencies, utilities, um, including a cogen facility, our tribal OSHA, which we call TOSHA, land use commission, environmental protection agencies, a full judicial a court system, including a court of appeals and a tribal employment rights office, public works, and also our own post office. All of these are on reservation governmental services that we provide. And we'd like to be able to, to take our, our tax sovereignty or our tax uh, revenues to be able to fund each of these services. Taxes paid to the state of Connecticut and the neighboring towns were estimated in 2018 to be roughly $10 million a year. This of course excludes the slot taxes that we pay to the state of Connecticut. In a part of a PR or kind of public service study that was done, we found that um, collectively with our uh, neighboring tribe, the Mohegans, we paid over or nearly seven billion dollars to the state of Connecticut over the last 25 years in taxes um, for our, our respective casinos. So again, all of these monies that go to the state of Connecticut and to our neighboring town instead of supporting our tribal programs and services. Thank you, Chief. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jean, and thank you for your insights. This is very a very important topic, and obviously it's one that we've been working hard on uh, with the TTAC. And so we appreciate you sharing that information, and, and we look forward to helping resolve that issue. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Jonathan Taylor, who is going to discuss some of his research regarding the positive impacts that tribal economic success has within their local municipalities and states. Jonathan? Thank you, Chief Malerba. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel of uh, thinkers and doers in this field. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Cape Cod, uh, the indigenous territory of the Nauset Indians who had a fish camp a few minutes walk from here. Um, my um, co-author, Kelly Croman, is a, a quite practical and experienced attorney and she represents the legal expertise in our paper. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the law, but I mostly wanna think about and talk about economics and public finance. Um, before I dive into that, let me say that this law is a mess. Uh, we say that in the paper and Justice Rehnquist said it and uh, Professor Richard Pomp produced a 320 page article trying to make sense of it. Uh, but finds that case by case, quote, case by case adjudication by courts is notoriously difficult as a means of imposing order and coherence to a body of doctrine. The Supreme Court has not distinguished itself, mischaracterizing the tax before it, abusing precedent, lapsing into ipse dixit reasoning, 
misreading or ignoring history and retreating into formalism. This poses a, a deep question for policymaking. Um, it's a deep and old question in American uh, political economy. The Federalist Papers really undertook to try to determine whether we could have government based on rational choice or accident and force. Those are not my words, those are Alexander Hamilton's words. And what we see in the case that uh, Gene Swift has articulated so forcefully and Kitke's remarks uh, underscore is that a lot of this is determined by accident and force. And it shouldn't be this way. To, to get us started, let me suggest that we should look at the public finance questions with at least two ledgers. The first ledger will be familiar. That is, who taxes what money and gets what revenue in exchange for what services? Uh, Chief Malerba referred to this as, a, as a, a, in her opening remarks. Um, where are the where are the school children going? Where are the revenues coming to fund for their educations? Um, is an issue also in the Mash and Tucket case. But there's a second ledger which we need to think about all the time, and that is, what is the appropriate level um, at which taxes should be collected and services provided? Uh, public goods and services are an important part of our life. They're an important distinguishing feature of federalism. And the choices um, need to reflect, as Kitke so forcefully put it, tribal prerogatives, tribal sovereignty, tribal culture, tribal um, knowledge of their local conditions. And all of this is made into a hash by federal law. Now, where do the economists come out on this? I'm sorry to say that some credentialed economists have portrayed American Indian economic development as a negative sum game. That is, as the Indians gain, the economies around them lose. I think that's a minority position. Um, my personal view is that it's not supported by the vast preponderance of the evidence. It's not even a zero sum game. That is where the tribes gain some economic activity and the, and the economies around them lose it. Instead, there's overwhelming systematic and uh, anecdotal evidence that when economies better utilize the physical, human, and natural resources on American Indian reservations, the economies grow. And when those economies grow, everybody's revenue, the tribal treasury, the county treasury, the state treasury, and the US treasury grow. This shouldn't be that controversial a point, but uh, unfortunately it still is. So the, the problem is in this, in this law, the um, opportunity exists for the states and local governments to insist on their primacy, on their right to tax on the reservation and put the tribes in the position of uh, Hobson's choice between adding their own taxes or um, letting them economic activity uh, continue unimpeded by this double tax burden. I'm gonna tell you about one case that I was involved in where South Dakota tried to come into the tribal casino at the Flandreau Santee Sioux tribe and tax the alcoholic beverage, the beer that was in the cup holder on the slot machine. And the tribe's position was, and federal law is pretty clear, that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act prohibits the taxation of gaming. And South Dakota's position was, that's okay, we're not taxing the gaming, but we are going to tax the alcoholic beverage sales, the restaurant sales, the hotel sales, the uh, convention center and gift shop and RV park, all that were associated with a casino. The, the, the state spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to litigate this at the same time that it was offering all kinds of different tax abatements, abatements that extend through the economy of South Dakota, covering agriculture, covering, covering even rodeo clowns. Um, and fortunately for the Flandreau Santee Sioux tribe, um, the federal courts found that um, 
South Dakota was overreaching in imposing these taxes. And I think this highlights an important background question um, or background analysis that needs to undergird all of this. And that is, what is the political economy of the unwillingness of state and local governments to abate tax, uh, their tax powers on Indian reservations. And I think we all know legislators face strong incentives to um, tax wherever the political economy permits them to tax and to provide service and uh, public goods wherever the political economy of their uh, jurisdiction requires them to. So this political economy uh, dynamic and the court's general failure to work out the principles that would counteract this political economy condition everything we're talking about today. And they condition um, what, what looks um, to be a, 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 a well-used vehicle for getting around this problem, which is tribal compacting. Tribes have gotten into agreements in Nevada and Washington and many other states um, to um, give the tribes the power to tax. And I think that's um, all well and good, but we should always recognize that, that those agreements take place against the backdrop of very significant political pressure. Um, to, to my knowledge, and I haven't studied this extensively, but it is generally the case that these compacts don't allow the tribes to exercise their sovereignty in tax competition. We see tax competition all over US federalism. I live in a state that's adjacent to a state that recruits us customers on the basis of having no sales tax for computers and cars and things. Um, and people go up to New Hampshire to buy those things. Um, that, that I think is a, a fundamental limitation of um, the background political economy. So that leaves me with, um, a sort of concluding observation that I think all of our conversations need to be focused, of course, on the law and on the economics. But I think we need to go back to Alexander Hamilton's question and think um, about the normative uh, contours of this policy debate. What is the ethical argument and how do we engage in the public persuasion necessary uh, to make a system that's based on reflection and choice rather than accident and force. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments and thank you for that article. We have shared it widely um, among TTAC and all of the people that we've been working with. Um, Casey, I didn't know if you had a, a, a response or a comment to Jonathan's discussion. You know, I, I had one kind of general comment and I kind of picking up on something that Jonathan mentioned and and uh, Kiki mentioned is this this idea of while there while there is dual taxation that's that is taking place in in Indian country and to some degree some of those tax revenues are being invested back in in tribal lands and maybe through some tax agreements uh, and the like. There still is this, this um, disadvantage uh, that tribes experience in regards to a current, the current federal Indian policy of self-determination that when those tax dollars leave and go to a different jurisdiction, so does the ability for the tribal government to exercise their own self-determination in terms of where those funds can be invested in the public goods in their, in their communities. And you know, in, in many of our communities, uh, there are different sort of questions that we pose that tribal leaders pose in regards to how do we deploy, to deploy these, these, uh, these revenues. So, you know, for many tribal communities, those public goods could be in the form of uh, native language programs or, or elders programs or uh, the, the protection of our sacred sites, um, et cetera. And I think that is one thing that that sort of complicates dual taxation and the delivery of public goods is who is making the decision on, on where those funds are invested. And I, I think Jonathan kind of alluded to that certainly 
that Kitke did as well. And I think that's a, a takeaway that for me strikes me as uh, a real opportunity. We're talking about taxing. We're really talking about the ability to support our communities and who has the decision-making authority. So uh, I think that is something in terms of food for thought for our attendees. Thank you. Uh, Kiki, did you have any reflection on, on Jonathan's comments? Uh, thank you, Chief Malera. Only to say that I'm in agreement. Um, this issue of dual taxation is something that's been of central importance here at our organization. Uh, we know that there are a variety of tax issues that are of concern to any country, but this issue of dual taxation, as you heard from Ms. Swift as well, is a huge priority for us because we understand that the, the broader, larger impacts that that has. You know, um, and to the earlier point that I was making, you know, we need these dollars uh, to, in order to make these sovereign choices, to make these sovereign decisions, to, to uh, make progress with the nation rebuilding arena. So thank you, Chief Lerner. Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to move to the topic of um, state and tribal compacts. In Connecticut, both the Mohegan tribe and the Mashantucket tribe have had to work hard to ensure that tax revenues from our tribal casinos were equitably distributed to our host communities. And, we, and it was something that we had to work on. And we have to remember that taxation of tribal businesses um, you know, doesn't factor into the genesis of economic benefits from the casinos, such as incremental employment, as you've heard, subsequent state taxes paid by those employees, um, nor the business to business purchasing with over 2000 businesses in Connecticut um, providing goods and services to our uh, tribal casinos and remembering that those businesses also pay taxes, make purchases with other local businesses and provide employment. So there's so many benefits to states uh, from tribal businesses. And so now we're going to hear from Chairman Melendez, who represents um, a very successful negotiating uh, or negotiation um, status with between his tribe and his state um, and how that compact has played out. Um, he's going to share how his nation has navigated the collection of tax revenues through compacting with his state in Nevada. So thank you, Chairman Melendez, for joining us today. Oh, Hamo. Thank you, Alain, uh, for inviting me. And uh, it's good to be on the panel today to talk about uh, taxation. Uh, my, I'm Char Chairman Arlen Melendez uh, with the Reno Sparks Inn and Colony. Uh, we're Washoe, Paiute, and Shoshone uh, people. We're located in Reno, Nevada, in the metro area. Uh, we've had a, a, a tax agreement, as you would say, or compact with the state of Nevada since 1991, where it was codified into state law. And uh, the, the tribes in Nevada, based on the fact that uh, you know we're not a we're in a gaming state where. Uh, tri there's very few tribes that actually are gaming tribes in the state of Nevada due to the competition in Las Vegas. So a taxation was uh, probably the most uh, uh, lucrative uh, revenue stream that we could uh, really identify uh, to try to fund tribal government, uh, you know, in those early years. And uh, the tribes uh, at that time in the 90s, we had... Uh, in the 80s, we actually had smoke shops like many of the Nevada tribes. And there were many uh, uh, impasses with the state of Nevada as to uh, uh, cigarettes that were sold on many of our reservations. So that was the business we started out with back in, uh, back in the 80s. So uh, today we've diversified from uh, uh, tobacco products to other type of sales tax entities. And, uh, you know, some of the issues having to do with uh, cases ending up in the uh, you know, Supreme Court having to do with this tax issue. The compacts allow us uh, basically to uh, negotiate with the state to try to resolve, uh, you know, find resolutions to impasse areas having to do with taxation and uh, move forward basically uh, so that the tribe could create a revenue stream of some sort, whether or not it's a tax sharing agreement, you know, or whether or not they'll allow you to, uh, to keep most of the tax revenue is, uh, you know, what we were looking at. Uh, we're very fortunate in the state of Nevada that the, uh, the main issue, I think, uh, when you look at the federal level back in the, and I think it was the 90s where 
where there were issues across the United States having to do with uh, what's termed as the unlevel playing field. And that's the position from the states. And what they were saying at that time was that if uh, tribes basically don't collect the tax at all, and the competition, which are everybody else, whether it's a 7-Eleven that's competing with you for cigarettes, and if the tribes don't collect the tax at all, the 7-Elevens maintained in their lobby, which was convenience store lobby, and when they tried to lobby for across the board legislation to Congress, they were saying that if the tribes don't collect a tax at all, they can basically price really low and basically everybody would gravitate to the reservation for cigarettes. And so that was what the state of Nevada was concerned about, the unlevel playing field. And that's why in the state of Nevada, they were saying uh, the state legislature and the tax commission said, if we can remedy the unlevel playing field uh, where you tax at the same rate as the state of Nevada, then we're not gonna uh, basically impose a collection of sales tax or excise tax on, on tobacco products. And as you know, uh, selling tobacco products, there's two taxes. One is the ex state excise tax, which is quite uh, you know, a, more money than say the sales tax, which is now at 18, 8% or something like that. And so the tax agreement that we entered into allows the tribe to collect and keep all of the revenue uh, at, as long as we tax at the same rate as the state. And so, as you know, when you talk about unlevel playing field, even the states aren't at the same level field. There's some states that don't collect sales tax at all, you know, Oregon, and I think there's some other states out west. So the tax rates are different. So we always wondered why, why this unlevel playing field was always directed at tribes, you know, when the states themselves don't even honor a level playing field when they all have different tax rates. So it didn't make much sense to our tribal council at that time, but to try to create some type of revenue stream, we basically uh, entered into this uh, tax agreement with the um, state of Nevada. So that's how we got into this. And, um, you know, when we think about uh, uh, what is the uh, usefulness of compacting well, basically it resolves those issues and it lets us move forward with uh, creating some type of revenue stream for the tribe. And uh, it, uh, there's some trade-offs, you know, when you really think about it. Uh, the one thing I do agree with is anytime you have an agreement with the state, whether it's IGRA or Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, it is a diminishment of sovereignty. And we recognize that even here with this compact, that it's a diminishment of sovereignty based on the fact that anytime uh, they're trying to tax on reservation land, we look at that as uh, infringement on sovereignty. So, but I guess it's probably the next best thing until we can resolve that, you know? And, um, and so that's kind of where we are today. Uh, the question uh, is how stable are these agreements? You know what I mean? If you're going to base loans off a of sales tax that you're collecting. Our tribal council asked the question, well, what if the, can they overturn this tax agreement? Can another legislature, state legislative body come in and uh, do away with it based on the shortfalls of the state? And there's a lot of unanswered questions. You know, the other question would be, what happens if you're, if you're taxing at the same rate as the state and they broaden out their tax base. What I mean by that is our tax agreements with the state have to do with tangible products, meaning that we've diversified from tobacco project, products, which are tangible to, you know, now we have uh, auto dealerships on tribal land, which are selling automobiles. Those are tangible products. So what happens if the state broadens their tax base and they lower the sales tax and they, uh, put in place some type of service tax so that they're not relying just on a uh, uh, tangible, basically sales tax. That means that if they should drop the sales tax from 8% to 6%, you know, that would be a substantial loss to our tribe. So we're always 
monitoring. We have lobbyists at the state to make sure that our input is there should they decide to diversify or broaden out the state tax base, which would hurt us by lowering the, tax, the sales tax. And then, uh, you know, the other challenge that we have is other tribes, you know, we're not the only tribe. So one tribe doing something, you know, that might be, seem to us negative can really affect us too, you know? So we're just one tribe trying to uh, negotiate, you know, as a separate sovereign from the other 28 tribes in the state of Nevada. So, you know, sometimes it's uh, like, uh, you know, it can be all over the place. Uh, other tribes might see it a little differently and stand totally on sovereignty, uh, you know, but we have to do what's best for us. Uh, so that's kind of uh, uh, what we're kind of looking at right now. Uh, uh, we don't, uh, you know, as you was mentioned, uh, there's a, when you have to stay at the same rate as the state, you know, you don't get the, uh, the flexibility to use it as, uh, as an enticement for businesses coming to the reservation. You know, there's uh, the, the cities of Reno and Sparks, they can basically uh, not even charge a tax to, to some development that comes into their cities, you know, and they can forego it because they're competing for the same development, even like Tesla, which came into uh, Reno, Sparks, Nevada, you know, the large uh, electric car, um, you know, a distributor, manufacturer, and basically they got some incentives because of tax. Well, the tribes are not be able to do that when we're, you know, when we have to stay at the same rate as the state. And so you can see that there is a disadvantage in, in enticing business to the reservation. You know, now the only thing we can do is maybe not charge a lease or something like that, you know, lease revenue. You might let them locate on, uh, tribal land for practically a minimum lease or no lease at all, which is another incentive. But as far as using the tax, uh, tax lowering the tax, you know, you can't really do that. And so that's a disadvantage. Um, how can we uh, increase our bargaining power in negotiating? Well, you know, when you really think about, when you really think about negotiation, the question is always who has the leverage? Is it the state or is it the tribe? So when you talk about leverage, it sometimes sounds like there's going to be winners or losers in that scenario. And so the idea would be, uh, you know, to try to create a win-win situation. And so we put a lot of effort into uh, building relationships with the cities and the counties and the state legislature. And so we don't kind of look at it as winners and losers. We try to create a win-win situation. So we've done a lot of uh, proactive work. We've uh, partnered with cities and counties and be building flood level levies. We donate. Uh, we actually were in a tax sharing agreement with one, one uh, development, a Walmart store. So that was a tax sharing agreement where we decided to uh, contribute about half a million dollars to Washoe County School District uh, since most of our kids go to the Washoe County School District and the tribal council kind of felt education was important and, and by, by doing it. And that was the only tax sharing agreement on just that one development, but the rest of them, the tribe keeps most of the, all of the uh, tax revenue. And so even today, you know, there's a, you know, you ask a question there, even in Congress today, there's a federal excise tax on tobacco products that's pending now, you know, and that'll be passed down all the way through wholesalers, all the way to the, to the tribal stores, you know, so we're, it never ends that we're impacted by uh, either Congress or somebody passing legislation that will affect us even through uh, tobacco products or whatever. So that's kind of uh, where we are with uh, the reasons why we, and then the other thing you can do is we've done some leakage studies to, to basically show that, uh, you know, the dollar doesn't really stay on reservation land because we're located in the city. We create jobs through the businesses that are located on tribal land. You know, we have six outlets that are tobacco stores where we employ, uh, we only employ about 50% tribal members. 50% of those are basically non-tribal members. So we do add to the economy. 
in building infrastructure. And, uh, you know, it really comes down to when the, when, the, when the tribes are strong, the state of Nevada is also strong. And if you can get that idea across, you know, by leakage studies or whatever, and building uh, partnerships and, and, and making friends, you know, the best you can. And I realize it's not the same everywhere, but we've, we've put a lot of effort into political contributions and all those different things to try to, when you really think about it, we, we can probably uh, have more impact to the state legislature than we can the Congress, because in Congress, in across the board legislation, we only have our Nevada senators, you know, and we're not in Washington DC all the time. The state legislature is only 30 miles down the road, so I can go over there every day if I have to and talk to those legislatures. Congress is a little different. If they come up with a cross-board legislation, I have to fly to DC. I have to meet with um, congressmen I don't really know, depending on what committees they sit on. Then you have to go to a number of committees to try to beat back even the legislation I just talked about. You know, We're trying to do it with our lobbies in DC now. So I'm just saying uh, that working with the state of Nevada and our own legislature is a little bit more, a little bit easier than trying to address some uh, uh, legislation through Congress that could basically hurt us. And it takes a lot of money and time to travel there to try to persuade uh, Congress to that it's not a good idea to, um, you know, to tax uh, tribal entities like ourselves or governments and and so that's kind of, you know, just some insight into what we're facing here in Nevada. It never ends. So we try to stay on top of it. So thank you, Lynn, for Thank you. And, and I truly appreciate your insights. And I think you've, you've really worked hard at that diplomatic relationship that um, has provided, you know, more, um, I think, incentive for the local governments to work with you. So thank you for that. Um, I would like to now move on to Ryan Nunn, who has done some really good research on um, a state and tribal compacts. And so we're happy to welcome you to the panel today. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much, Chief Malara. Um, I am Ryan Nunn. I help lead the CICD's research. I work closely with Casey and the rest of the team. And recently, the CICD commissioned analysis by legal scholars and policy experts on a few topics one of which is tribal state tax compacts. And this isn't because we think tax compacts are the best way to resolve all the problems discussed in this event, but given the current uh, legal regime, compacts can have a role to play. And I'd like to just take a couple minutes to summarize some of the key points of CICD's commissioned work on tax compacts. So what I'll describe is an article by Mark Cowan of Boise State University, which we will be publishing on the CICD website. Cowan examines a variety of different tax compacts and extracts general lessons from their use. Tax compacts can help resolve or address several issues. First, overlapping tax jurisdiction. Second, the difficulty in some cases of administering and collecting revenue from taxes. And third, uh, compacts can reduce the chance of costly litigation and make taxes more predictable, uh, in addition to other issues discussed in Cowan's paper. But despite their wide use, we really don't know a lot about uh, tax compacts, broadly speaking. And to help illuminate them, what Cowan does is he draws up a list of examples, he covers 10 compacts, seven tribes, eight states, and several types of taxes. And then he identifies what they do and they don't have in common. He focuses first on a few considerations, whether or not the compact contains an acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty, the process for dispute resolution, and the essence of how revenues are collected and allocated. These vary quite a bit across the studied tax compacts. So for example, uh, considering the 2005 fuel tax compact between the Blackfeet Nation and the state of Montana, that compact does not directly acknowledge tribal sovereignty. Dispute resolution is through a US district court, or if that court lacks jurisdiction, a state district court. And under the compact, the state collects fuel tax on the reservation at the same rate as throughout Montana. It then remits to the tribe the estimated revenue that was collect collected from tribal members, though not any estimated revenues collected from non-tribal members on the reservation. So all of these details are rather different than those of a 2016 tobacco compact 
between the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska and the state of Kansas, just to pick a, an example that has some different characteristics. And as detailed in that compact, sovereignty is acknowledged. Dispute resolution starts with arbitration before US district court. And the tribe collects the tax itself uh, at a specified minimum level and then retains all revenues, whether from tribal members or non-members. And then looking at the overall picture, Cowan emphasizes the importance of tribes and states having clear ongoing communication, as well as robust acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty. He also notes the importance of tailoring compacts to the specific needs of particular parties and situations, uh, and says that doing so will be much easier in the future if the details of past tax compacts are well understood. Um, and we hope that this work is a step in that direction. So thank you very much for your time and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. So uh, thank you very much for the research that you've been doing. And I know it's important to all of us because it helps us try to think about how we might work more closely with our states and, and what some of the best practices are. It's very important to understand the sovereign choice and advocacy of tribes around taxation I'm generally with a multitude of ways to solve and resolve taxation. So every tribe will come at taxation from a different perspective, experience, cultural considerations, and positions to implement their actions of sovereign choice for their communities. It's critical that everyone understand the sovereign rights of a tribe to make their own sovereign choice. And then so now I'd like to invite Professor Stacy Leeds to discuss tax implications um, in her recently co-authored article, A Wealth of Sovereign Choices, Tax Implications of the McGirt of the Oklahoma and the Promise of Tribal Economic Development. So welcome, Stacey. Thank you. And I'm going to very quickly try to talk about McGirt and business entity selection along with taxation as part of these choices. Um, McGirt was undoubtedly a long overdue win for what we call the five tribes in eastern Oklahoma. First and most directly relevant, the Muscogee Creek Nation, and thereafter the case is now applicable to Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole Nations. The decision was straightforward. At the time the, of removal and relocation, reservation boundaries were negotiated, they were treaty guaranteed, and they remain intact today. These boundaries remain despite Oklahoma statehood and the allotment process, and Congress has never passed legislation to take those boundaries away. And um, persistent disregard for those facts don't change the underlying state of the law. Um, in the McGirt tax pay, uh, paper that's being shared with you, my co-author Lonnie Beard and I argue that McGirt cannot just mean that the tribes now have more responsibility to prosecute tribes or prosecute crimes, but it, most also, it must also mean that there is a reclamation and reassertion of other aspects of sovereign territorial jurisdiction. With that, that's a pretty hollow victory in McGirt. Um, when Justice Gorsuch now famously noted at the end of the Trail of Tears was a promise, that promise was a very big one, and it meant at the core self-governance and the same sovereign choices other sovereigns get to make every day. So the tax issue is now the elephant in the living room in Oklahoma. If we start with individual income tax, the law has been quite clear on this point for some time. When it comes to income tax of tribal citizens who derive their income inside their tribe's Indian country, that individual income is exempt from state taxes. And there are many United States Supreme Court precedents that state this point very clearly from McClanahan versus Arizona in 1973, all the way up to present. And it applies to Oklahoma too, as we saw in the Sack and Fox case in 1993 and later in the Chickasaw case. And Oklahoma knows this. Oklahoma statutes specifically incorporate 1850, 18 USC 1151, um, federal Indian country statute definition into the state tax code. Still, Oklahoma appears to be taking the position that McGirt only applies to major federal crimes and nothing in terms of the tribe's powers or civil regulatory arena. And that's a bold position. And I haven't seen an Indian law expert or a tax expert repeat that with a straight face that's also coupled with any legal authority. 
conventional wisdom out there tells us that if this very narrow individual income tax question is squarely presented to a federal district court, the outcome will most likely fall in line with all of the other individual income tax cases. In the meantime, many individual tribal citizens, including myself, are in the process of exhausting Oklahoma Tax Commission remedies by challenging proposed assessments. And the Oklahoma Tax Commission is not being very aggressive about setting timely hearings to provide an opportunity for these protests to be heard, but they are being very aggressive in rejecting tribal exemption claims, including threats to nursing um, licenses of some of the frontline indigenous healthcare workers who are trying to take this exemption during a pandemic, no less. And so most of the tribal um, citizens that are taking these exemptions cannot go out and hire a, an attorney who's an expert in Indian tax law. And they particularly, um, you know, this is the case if they're, they're facing face uh, strong penalties or other financial threats, threats to their livelihood in some instances. Um, but at some point, the tribes will likely get involved in um, this case, and there's a clear procedural path for them to do so. Individuals, as you all know, can't go directly to a federal forum because the Federal Anti-Injunction Act would prohibit that type of individual claim, but tribes can do so by seeking injunctive relief on behalf of its members and um, uh, trying to set aside that unlawful state taxation that is preempted by treaty rights. And that was the path that the Sac and Fox tribe and Chickasaw cases followed, as well as many others. But beyond the litigation of these income tax consideration and the question about whether to impose a certain tax or not, there's also a bigger picture moment I see for tribal governments in terms of action and advocacy. And that's providing a legal and regulatory infrastructure at the tribal level for robust business entity selection choices, not just for the tribal government and its businesses, but for the benefit of small business owners inside of the reservation to give them the same choices as tribally owned businesses have, and maybe even some more creative ones. And this will assist business owners as they seek clarity about their own tax liability and on tax questions that are necessarily um, going to impact their business entity choices. Tribal attorneys spend a lot of time thinking about how to create consensual relationships with non-Indian entities so that it's clear where the tribal jurisdictional contours lie. But we often don't spend that same type of energy and resources thinking about how to provide meaningful choices to tribal citizen business owners so that they aren't forced to enter into consensual relationships with states as their only option. Right now, the norm in Oklahoma is that tribal citizens who are business owners are forced to make their business entity selections with the state of Oklahoma under state law because they lack those choices under tribal law and perhaps various other barriers. Um, it makes it easier to just simply register with the state of Oklahoma. And doing so, it creates three unfortunate things. It arguably subjects that tribal citizen business owner to suits in state court where there otherwise is no legal basis. It arguably subject, subjects a tribal citizen and their business to state taxation where there's otherwise no legal basis, which squarely tees up the dual taxation concerns that have already been talked about today. And then finally, it kills the tribe's ability to collect useful and complete data on their tribal citizen owned businesses. Right now, the only way to see how many tribal citizen owned businesses there are inside of a reservation with the five tribes in Oklahoma is to look at the tribe's tarot list or business license list. And that only captures the people who are in direct vendor relationships with the tribes. Most business owners are not. And think about your ag producer or your grocery store owner or somebody with a landscaping business or a small factory that makes things that fall outside of the typical tribal RFPs or even a professional services firm. And even if there are provisions in a tribal code that still might, um, there still might be this on the ground practice that as a default, people just go to the state. And I glanced again just this morning at the tribal tarot requirements on various tribal websites. And most of them want to see a date of incorporation with the state and articles of incorporation filed with the state as a threshold to being on the tribe's tarot list. So we're actually pushing people in the direction of the state 
maybe without thinking it all through, but then also maybe just thinking that that's a priority set that they're not ready to tackle yet. And so it's not unusual for a tribe to have a code that assists tribal businesses in their formation. And it's not unusual for a tribe to have um, a way that outside entities register with the tribe if they're doing business with the tribe. What is unusual is equipping our own private business owners with the same tools that the tribes have created for themselves. So to conclude on the data side, we don't know how many tribal citizen businesses there are on the reservations here. We only know the ones that are um, on the tribes tarot certified list or we require or instruct or remain silent as those small business owners become state regulated business entities to some degree. And if we're going to advocate and think about rebuilding these economies, we need to have all the data and we need to have good data. At present, the only way that you would know about tribal private enterprises, that's tribal citizens businesses, um, within the five tribes reservations in Oklahoma would be to get the list of Oklahoma's owners, cross list them with a tribal cit citizen census, and then reduce those crossovers with address and zip codes to confine it within the territorial boundaries of a particular tribe. And as I conclude, I just want to say I'm not knocking the five tribes, I'm nudging them. In this last year, these tribal leaders and the day-to-day -day tribal employees have absolutely been um, rising to the occasion in a Herculean way after McGirt. And they are doing literally three generations of worth, worth of work in the present and immediate future. They're underfunded, they're short staffed, and they are doing an amazing job because they have waited over 100 years for this magic moment, right? But now they have the privilege to act on those promises demanded of our ancestors at pretty immeasurable cost. And so in conclusion, um, as these tribes are dealing with 50 fold increases in their criminal dockets and planning for transitions to get the cases on the civil side involving Indian children back to tribal institutions, this is also a big glaring next step to be embarked on. Um, and I think that folks are up for the task, but I will throw that out there for discussion. And thanks for having me. Thank you, Stacy, so very much. I know that there's so much to talk about with that decision. And I thank everyone today on this panel for their really thoughtful work and insights. So while I do a little bit of a wrap up, if you have any questions for the panel, would you mind posting them on the chat? Um, as we do think about some of the key points made today, I reflect on the conversation that we've shared today. Um, one is that tribal sovereignty is really the fundamental concept around tribal taxation on reservations that everyone, including decision makers, must understand. States are not losing money when tribes are in control and successful. States and the surrounding communities stand so much to gain in so many other ways. Um, that they should not consider taxation the most important issue. It is each tribe's sovereign choice to decide how a taxation system should work for them and work for their communities. Tribes have additional responsibilities that states don't have, such as nation building, language restoration, and protection of sacred sites, as, as I mentioned earlier today. Sovereign choice does not mean that tribes must be taxing as an essential exercise of government structure. Taxation is a very Western government lens of good governance that doesn't necessarily fit with some tribes' uh, cultural beliefs or values. Um, taxing economic development and business versus taxing individuals are two very different conversations. Most, though not all, of today's talking points have been focused on the economic incidence of taxation. And also, lastly, there's you know, vast diversity, not only in how the United States and tribal relations look, but also how the tribal state relations look and how tribes should think about tribal taxation and, and how good governance is defined according to their needs. So the policy takeaways are opportunity, sovereign choice, what is the ability of the congressional and community staffers to assist in influencing change alongside Indian country? What policy conversations can staffers tee up for their member around taxation in Indian country? How can tribes and states work alongside one another to develop fair tax agreements and compacts? And you know, what are you know, the, the places that staffers can plug in and, and take some action? Um, and so now we'll turn to uh, Q&A. And um, if I believe that there may be some questions that we already have on the chat, 
Um, but if there are other questions that you may like to ask, please don't hesitate. We have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. All right, so here is uh, one question you know, for the panel, and I would ask anyone who might um, wish to answer. Uh, working in the policy state, space, what does a tangible step forward look like in addressing policy changes on taxation, um, i.e. Treasury Tribal Advisory Committee recommendations, and how do these policy recommendations get an audience, and who is the audience? So I would throw that out to the group to see if anyone would like to um, take, an, uh, take a stab at an answer there. Vicky? Yeah, sorry about that. I was on mute there for a second. Um, so I want to respond to that, but I want to take the question out a little bit further too, to Chief Belibra, if I may, for a second. And this just Please appeared do. to me, just came to my mind as I was hearing the other panelists. You know, we use a lot of language in these discussions, but I sometimes don't think that we pause long enough to really understand the meaning behind what we're saying. So where I'm going with this thought to the question in terms of policy and how we can move forward with this. A lot of what we talked about today had to do with complications and challenges that we're experiencing at the local and state level. But if you think about that for a minute, when we often talk about the advocacy work that we do, we talk about government to government, nation to nation, this sovereign to sovereign relationship from a US federal standpoint. And even though it's an antiquated concept, the notion of the federal government is our trustee, right? And one of the embedded conflicts in the relationship that exists right now is, this conflict that uh, federal representatives have when they're advocating in their role uh, as a representative in the Congress or in the Senate, but also being elected from their state constituency. Uh, but when it comes to these conflicts and, it, and you think about the role of what a trustee should be, when we're having these challenges with local communities and with states, those are the ripe moments for the federal trustee to be intervening, to be taking our side in support of uh, supporting and promoting and upholding our sovereign rights and authorities. Uh, we know very well that uh, states and especially local uh, county level governments don't have an appreciation, respect or understanding uh, for that sovereignty. So we are in this kind of new moment uh, of US federal relations. We are in an administration right now that, that speaks about economic sovereignty support and, and exerting sovereign rights and authorities. That can't happen if we continue to have all these challenges at the state and local level. So in a very broad, general sense, you know, what we would like to see from the advocacy standpoint of the work that we do is to see greater active involvement from DOJ, Treasury, BIA, all these entities who are part of this, that when we run into these conflicts and challenges with those government entities, that they are there by our side uh, fighting in support of us. Thank you. And that is one of the recommendations that we've made um, from the TTAC is that the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Department of uh, Treasury, as well as the Department of Justice, need to look at all the taxation issues and where they might even be able to make administrative changes versus you know, requiring legislative change. Um, but until they identify those opportunities, I'm, you know, we are really you know, just looking at legislative strategies. And so we're hoping to work through some of those. And I appreciate that comment. Um, one question we had was in Oklahoma, is it possible for the five tribes to get a state exempt status applied to their tribal IDs? And so I would um, ask uh, that, um, Stacey, you answer that question. You bet. I do think this is one of the things that would be ripe for compacting. Um, the state of Oklahoma and the five tribes already do this with car tags. Um, we know who legally has them, um, whether they're a valid tag and these types of things. Um, it wouldn't necessarily resolve where all of your income came from, but it would resolve these preliminary questions of, is this person a tribal citizen and do they live within the boundary? And that would get us a pretty long way down the road. Um, Oklahoma Tax Commission still seems to take the position that you have to live on restricted or trust property within that reservation. Um, but yes, that's one of those things that I think could be a compact point um, to help tribal citizens out. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, are there examples of tribal tax codes that we can refer to for utilities on tribal lands, especially for ISPs located on tribal lands for broadband service? Um, so I'm not sure who might be able to answer that. Ryan, I don't know if, you know, in your research you found anything regarding that? 
That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure that I have an answer to it, but it's something we'll we'll think about and and that we hope to to address in the in the work on this. Great, thank you. Uh, next comment was: Can Mr. Kitke Carroll repeat his top eight challenges? And do any other panelists have additional challenges they would like to highlight aside from what they discussed in their presentation? So back to you, Kiki. So I saw that in the chat. I just dropped them in there in response. Okay. And just be clear, those are not mine, nor do they belong to USET. Uh, those were the top challenges identified in, in the Growing Economies in Any Country workshop and put out by the Federal Reserve. Great, thank you. Um, Let's see, we have a question from Will Micklin. Uh, Big Sandy Enterprises uh, v. Bonta appears to be a significant challenge to improving tribal taxation authority, especially off tribal lands under the Wagnon three-pronged analytical test and its interpretation of the Indian Trader Act. Um, so does anyone have a comment on that? I know that is one of the recommendations too, is that we update and look at the Indian Trader Act uh, because it's been a long time since um, that's been updated. Uh, next question, what inhibits other tribes and local and state governments from moving forward on tax compact discussions? And this one is directed to uh, Chairman Melendez. Uh, could you repeat that again? Sure, um, let's see. Um, what inhibits other tribes and local and state governments from moving forward on tax compact discussions um, such as you've had? Do you think that there are reasons why other tribes and within their states and local governments haven't moved forward as you have? I think other tribes have, you know, in Washington state and surrounding states. Um, so there are a number of uh, compacts. Some of the Areas like gas tax are coming to the forefront now, even in the state of Nevada, which is, uh, you know, we, there isn't really a, a, a gasoline tax where tribes uh, are, they're letting you basically collect on your native people at the pump. But I think uh, that issue is broadening out a little more. So we're, you know, even though we have tangible products, we're kind of looking at, uh, seeing the gas situation right in the state of Nevada. But I think many tribes in Arizona in, the, in our region are basically uh, already addressing issues with the state on compacts. Great. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. And then the last question is um, sent in by Jackson Brossi. And the question is, does the panel believe that modernizing the Department of Indians Indian Trader statutes uh, would allow for a real and critical review to the problem of dual taxation. So I'll jump in here. Um, I, I think that it would, and I would add into that critical review questions about um, if the tribes are not going to be recognized uh, by the states as having the authority of um, the business entity selection. I'm wondering if there is a small regulatory scheme where just like there are federally charted tribal corporations, there could be individuals who go on and do their incorporation through a federal database as opposed to the state, then there would be that um, subsequent verification that they're a duly enrolled tribal member of that tribe where they're located and that solves that problem. Great, thank you. And that is one of the recommendations from TTAC is to review that um, and then lastly, you know, I think that, you know, we are going to have to look at both administrative um, review and administrative fixes, as well as legislative fixes um, to the problem of dual taxation. But I think we can take a two-pronged approach. Kiki, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, well, just one thing before I forget that I wanted to mention uh, a little bit earlier, and apologies, I didn't adjust my screen, my camera when I sat back down. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when we're thinking about uh, nation rebuilding, you know, a lot of the conversation today recognizes that we are in a moment right now in our history where tribes are becoming much more sophisticated in how we go about this. Uh, after all those years of uh, failed uh, federal policies that had very negative effect on our communities and nations. But one of the things, you know, when we're talking about this tax conversation, you know, if you think about any country, it's all about precedent, right? Precedent, precedent, precedent. And 
you know, one of the things that we've had conversation about within our organization is regardless of where you are in your economic development efforts, from a precedent standpoint, it is critically important to consider establishing tax code that when that moment does arrive, that you have precedent that you can argue from, that you're not putting these things just in place today and then negotiating and arguing from that starting point, but that you've had this in place as a government structure, they've been there, and now you're just using them to a greater extent because you have more economic activity going on. I think as tribal nation governments, we have uh, a responsibility to lay the foundation to some of these things that we're talking about to set that precedent that will support our, our efforts later on down the road. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. And I think that's where the nation rebuilding comes in. We have to have a very strong legislative and judicial system within our own tribe so that we can point to the codes that we're writing and the laws that we're writing and how we plan to enforce them and implement them. That's a very key point to what we're doing as tribes these days. And I'm sorry, Chief, just one last thing too, and this, this extends outside of just the tax space. Um, so oftentimes when we're having these conversations, we're talking about federal Indian law and we're trying to navigate what we're doing in our sovereignty space using federal Indian law as the guard, rail, guard post to that and guardrails. And I understand that and that's a necessity. But when we're talking about a dual track strategy and we're talking longer term, you know, another one of these things that, we're, that Indian country recognizes today is that our approach has to pivot and adjust as well. And rather than coming from a federal Indian policy standpoint, coming from a tribal law standpoint, as sovereigns, if we're going to talk about sovereignty, that means writing the rules and the laws as they pertain to our nations. Now, I know it's a lot more complicated than that. It's not as simple as saying we need to do that, we're going to do that. But with every opportunity that we have to exert that authority through tribal law, rather than just allowing ourselves to be dictated from federal Indian law and the laws of another sovereign. Yeah, correct. Couldn't agree more. All right, unfortunately, we are out of time for more questions. Um, and I did want to just turn over um, the panel to Casey Lozar for closing comments and, and last words of wisdom. So thank you again for hosting today. I think this was a really important discussion that we've had. Thank you, Chief Malerba. And, and, and you're right, what, a, what an incredible uh, discussion and certainly uh, a, a complicated uh, topic for, for all of our attendees and a complicated uh, topic for tribal leaders throughout the country. Um, you know, I, as I sort of shared at the, at the top of the event today, our mission at the, the center is to really assist tribes in reaching their full economic potential. And certainly based on today's conversation, taxation uh, or, or better yet, taxi, getting taxation right in Indian country uh, is critically important in creating sort of that, that economic infrastructure that, that our tribal communities which includes both uh, tribal members and non-members really need and, and deserve. So I, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Chief Malerba, for moderating the discussion um, today and for, for each of the panelists for sharing your, your expertise and your thoughts and perspectives from your, from, from your community, from your institution, which you uh, represent. Uh, I, I also certainly wanted to, to thank uh, my colleague, Heather Sober-Pena, um, colleague at the center for coordinating today's uh, webinar and our, and our team member, Rory Taylor, for uh, producing a, a number of pieces of content leading up to today's event. Um, and, and before we uh, sign off, I did have one announcement. Um, on December 9th and 10th uh, of this year, the Center for Indian Country Development uh, will be hosting its inaugural research summit, um, which is very exciting for us. There'll be a, a great cast of uh, Indian country economic researchers, tribal leaders, community practitioners, and, and students uh, presenting new research and, and discussing the policy implications of their work. And we, we hope you will all join us uh, for, for the summit. Um, just as a reminder, you know, please visit our website at minneapolisfed.org uh, forward slash Indian country uh, to catch up on all of our, uh, our updates and our research and our events. And uh, I just want to note too that we, we're all here to, to serve uh, each and every one of you. So please uh, feel free to reach out to, to me, my colleagues at the center at, at any time. So thank you all uh, for joining today, uh, Lem Lemps and, and stay healthy. Thank you.